If it does, please bear with me. Okay, so I'm go what I'm going to present for you today, uh, the title of the presentation is Keeping the ABI Somewhat Sane. Uh, and I hope that at the end of the presentation, we can drop the word somewhat from the title and we just think that the ABI is, well, just sane. Uh, is the volume all right? Louder? Okay. So my name is Gabriel. I work for IBM. And yeah, let's go. So this is what we're going to cover today. I will start with an introduction, as usual. And then I will give you the concept of what it means to break an ABI. Um, after that, I will explain uh, what zoning versioning is and how does this relate to ABI breaks, as well as I will explain the same, thi the same thing for symbol versioning, which are kind of uh, similar things. And after that, I will explain a different concept, which is uh, how to use header magic to make some function redirections. Uh, and when I uh, explain these three parts, I will give you some fictional examples from a fake library that I have written especially for this presentation. And after that, uh, so that it doesn't get uh, all too fictional, I will jump into some real world examples uh, in GLibc, which is the project that I work for at IBM. And in the end, we'll have the conclusion as usual. Okay, so even before the introduction, I put this message there because this is one of the messages that I saw a very long time ago and I didn't know what it meant. And I would like to know if anybody here have already seen this before. So, oh yeah, so it's not just, not just me. Okay, so I have seen this message before when I was still working with hardware development. At the time I was using proprietary software and that proprietary software was built by some company. I will not name any, I will not name anyone here, but yeah, I got this uh, proprietary software from the internet and I wanted to run this in Linux. At the time, I guess I was using Debian or CentOS, I don't know. Uh, but the thing, the thing is, the software was too new for my very old operating system. And the software was complaining that my GLibc was too old and it required some new functions, well, some new things uh, from this GLibc2 dot whatever function that was at the time. I didn't know what that meant at the time, but the thing I did, I just updated my operating system I got and my proprietary software uh, stopped, started working again. Okay, so this is, this is uh, where the introduction actually begins. I'll try to be fast here because I, I think that you all know what an API means. I want to bring just a small part of it. So I got this snippet from the book Virtual Machines from James Smith and Ravi Nair, which I used a lot uh, during my time at the university. I'll read it, uh, so quote, an API, typically defined at the source code level, enables applications written to that API to be ported easily via recompilation to any system that supports the same API, end quote. And I'm looking at Mauricio right now because I know that he's going to present uh, his effort to port the Debian operating system to PowerPC 64-bit little engine, is that right? And I'm sure that he didn't think it was easy. So I didn't write that easily uh, word there. It's from the book. So yeah, they have a point there, but I'm not trying to mock you, okay? Okay, so what this uh, sentence means, and Tulio helped me a lot with this, is that the API is about the source code level. I made many mistakes when discussing this with him at, uh, in our time at IBM, but now I know that the API is about the source code level. So. An API, you think about the API when you're thinking about library headers and you're going to compile your code, you're going to write your C code, then you're thinking about the API. And what is part of this API that we're going to be uh, using in this presentation is the library routines. So the library routines are part of the API. The API contains the library routines. Okay, as opposed to the API, there is the ABI. So once you get your source code compiled, and it becomes a binary, then you don't care about the API anymore. You just care about the ABI, which is the application binary interface. And I, I got a new snippet, again, from the same book, from the same guys, and it reads, 
quote, a program binary compiled to a specific ABI can be run unchanged only on a system with the same ISA and operating system, end quote. Uh, and this is not uh, all that the book has to say about the ABI, but it's a small part that is uh, relevant for us now. So what it means, it says two things there. It says that the ISA cannot change. You cannot take one binary from, uh, from a platform and run it on another platform. So if you have your program built for the PowerPC architecture, uh, it cannot run on a RISC-V uh, computer. Uh, that's as easy as that. But it also uh, mentions uh, that the system call interface needs to be the same. And I added a small mark there in the system call interface because uh, this is Linux Developer Conference and sometimes you think of system calls as just the sys calls in the, in the kernel, in the Linux kernel. This is not what they mean. This is not what James Smith and Ravi Nair think of when they think of an operating system. They're thinking of the libraries as well. They're thinking of many things uh, and all these things are part of the, the operating system. It's not just the kernel. What else is in, what else is in the ABI? Uh, there are more things in the ABI, for instance, the calling convention. So uh, how, do you pass red, uh, how do you pass parameters to your function that you're trying to call? Are they going uh, to the function through registers or in memory that's in the ABI, that's defined in the ABI? Also, data structures. Uh, they're supposed to be known at compile time how the data structures, the, the design or the, the layout of the data structure. So this needs to be uh, uh, known at compile time and it's not going to change. Uh, otherwise, you change the ABI. Also, the size and format of basic types. For instance, how many bits does the integer type int have? Does it have 32 bits or 64 bits? This is defined by the ABI and different uh, size and format of basic times being, means different ABIs. Also, on an operating system level, uh, this is, uh, oh, these three things that I mentioned above uh, are more uh, closely related to libraries, and al but also part of the ABI is the binary format of executable. So in the Linux operating system, uh, we're talking about ELF. Okay. Uh, and as, as, as I said, I prepared some examples from a fictional uh, library. Uh, well, it's not fictional anymore because I have uh, created it. So yeah, it's all this toy example, let me say. So if you want to download it, you can go to this address and uh, you can verify that what I have brought here actually works and I'm not lying to you. So in the first version of the library, uh, I have this API. It's just uh, one header file which defines one simple function which returns an integer type and it takes no parameters. So this is the API of the first version of the library. Oh, yeah, and now the ABI. So if the ABI is closely related to the API, but now we're not thinking about source code anymore. So if I use one of the tools that reads the ELF binary, so binaries there are in the ELF format. I can list the symbols that it has, that a library, that a shared, shared library has. So libamazing.so is the shared library. So if I list the symbols in there, I'm going to find the libamazing constant function that uh, was in the API. So that's the ABI uh, of this first version of the library. Okay, so let's uh, jump into what, it, what we brought for this uh, presentation. Just a second. Okay, so uh, how do you break an ABI? Well, if you break the API, you certainly break the ABI. So if you remove a routine from the API, well, the ABI changed. So if you change the parameter list of some function, you change the API. If you change the return type, same thing. And if you change some data structure, it has the same effect and this means that the ABI is, has been broken. So breaking the API breaks the ABI. But not only change, uh, changes to the API, ch to the API change the ABI. If you just change the format of a type, maybe your API didn't change, but the ABI is, is, is new. Also, if you change the behavior of a function, 
uh, the ABI is changed again. So let's give a, let's give an example. If you have a function that usually prints to the terminal, and your user program. So suppose you wrote a user program that used my library function, and when you run your program, it prints something to the terminal. If I change the library, and now the function uh, makes a remote connection to some server on the internet, you're not expecting this, right? It's crazy change, but yeah, this is a change to the behavior of the function, and this is a change to the API. This is a change in the compromise that the commitment that I have done to you. Okay, and what is the problem with breaking the ABI? It causes a lot of trouble. So when you change the ABI, your program, uh, it's going to probably it's going to crash. And if it if it doesn't crash, it produces weird results. And there is a cost uh, when uh, the a when the ABI changes because user programs need to be fixed. So if I change the ABI uh, through a change to the API, then you have to patch your software. You have to change uh, how you wrote your C code uh, so that it works with the new version of the library. Also, uh, downstream has to do a lot of rebuilds because, uh, well, you have to patch your software. Everybody that uses my library has to patch uh, their software, and this means that the downstream has a lot of work uh, to rebuild everything. Also, uh, if some user program wants to use the older version of the library, then we might have to distribute two versions of a said library because we want all user programs to work, and this is also more cost to downstream developers. Okay, so let's break the ABI with our toy example, which is not fictional anymore. Uh, so this is the second version of libamazing. And this time I changed the return type of that function, that simple function. It used to return an integer, and now it returns a float. So as I said previously, it's going to break uh, a lot of user programs. It's going to break programs that's been, that have been compiled against the older version of the libraries. Same, as, same uh, just stating again, they might crash or just produce uh, wrong output and it needs code fixing and rebuilds. I'm repeating myself, I don't know why. Okay, so how do you, how do you fix that? You don't want uh, your user programs to just crash in your face, uh, that's bad. Uh, you don't want user programs to produce weird outputs, that's even worse. Uh, so we want to catch problems early. And how do you do that? Uh, we have the sole name version in Scheme. A lot of people might know about it but it's a way to announce a backwards incompatible ABI break. So I want to let user programs know that the ABI is changed, and that's how we do this with sole name versioning. So if you don't remember of what a sole name version looks like, it looks like this example there. So libc.so.6 is the sole name version of the current glibc uh, software, also all this the other examples there, uh, they are examples of sole name versions. Okay, so when I made that change to, this, to the API and ABI, I forgot. So let's say I forgot to, uh, to bump the sole name version. And now in this third version of the library, I'm going to fix that mistake. So I'm going to use the sole name versioning mechanism and change the sole name version. So how do you do it? You have this compiler option, which is the dash WL, which tells GCC to pass the next command to the linker, and then dash so name and uh, a string there, libamazing.2 is the name of the new ABI that I'm going to uh, tell user programs uh, that this is the new version. The old version is different. And how do you check uh, that this, this command actually produced something useful? Then you use uh, the read L program again, and if you grab for the so name string, then you get this output. Hey, this is so name. The library's so name is libamazing.so.2. And how does this help actually in catching problems early? So let's say that ma that guy there that he has uh, his user program which's been compiled for against the older version of the library. And his program is asking for libamazing.so.1 because he was using the previous version. So he gets his program 
and puts it in a new operate in a new machine which doesn't have libamazing.so.1. It just has the new version. And when he tries to run his program, he gets this nice message which is telling him something meaningful that the library is not there. He's not going to see a crash or even worse, not see anything at all and then get weird results. Okay, so this is how uh, so named versioning works. And it has this uh, characteristic that sometimes you have to distribute many versions of the same library because, well, uh, that user programs want the other version and a new program might want to use the newer version. So you have to distribute, distribute multiple versions of the library. But what if, what if we don't want to make this change to the so name? What if we want to keep the so name the same so that we don't have that extra cost? How do we do that? But we still want to change the function of the, the behavior of the function or the signature of the function. Then we can have one function name with many versions, many implementations of the same function name. And how do you do it? Is that even possible? Yeah, you can use uh, the version commands which is provided by Binutils. And I'll read a small snippet from its manual. It reads, quote, the dynamic linker can use symbol versioning, I'm sorry, can use symbol versions to select a specific version of a function. Exactly what we want. We want to have multiple versions of the same function and not change this so name, so not needing to distribute multiple versions of the library. And how do you do it? You use the version script command, very similar to the so name command. Uh, but it gets uh, a versions file as the parameter of as the argument to the function to the to the option. And what does this versions file look like? This is the the syntax of the version script, and it's composed of many blocks. And these blocks have a name, and they have a list of functions that are tied to that name. So in this uh, syntax, we have two blocks. The first one I named older version name, second one newer version name. I could have given any name there. I could have said that the first version is cat and that the second version is dog. And how do you know which one is older? Is it the cat or the dog? We don't know. Uh, so it doesn't matter uh, if you put numbers here. It's not because of the number that you know which one is newer or older. It's because they have a dependency and that's what the last line in this block is saying us. So newer version is uh, derived from older version. Yeah, it, it has a parent. Yeah, think of, think of it as a list. So we want to use this in our uh, amazing uh, example, libamazing version 1.0. And then we have, we can uh, fill in this version script, uh, versions file, and you, you can see that uh, libamazing constant is listed twice, which means that there are going to be two versions of libamazing constant in our library. But yeah, uh, this is a very simple code. So, but how do you write two versions of a function in a C file with the same name of the function? We all know that we cannot do this. So we actually do something that is not uh, not at all complicated. We just write two different version names. So there is the newer version, which returns a float. And the name of the function is float leave amazing constant. And also, you can have the older version of that function, which returns names and has the, a prefix. So we don't have a name clash. But how do we tell uh, the compiler that these two functions, they are actually the same. They have to use, they use the same name. So we use that uh, assembler statement over there, which uses the dot simver uh, directive. That's how I think they name it. And then you you tie the libamazing constant name to the name of the function, uh, to the name of that particular implementation of the function. Okay, and after you do this, uh, let's see what it pr what it produces. So if you again open the shared library object with read elf, you, we can see that there are two libamazing constant functions there, but they have that uh, version string appended to them. 
And I want you to notice that th in the first line, you have a single at character, and in the second line, you have two uh, at characters. And this is uh, how, they, uh, how the Benutils assembler distinguishes which, is which one is the default version at the time you build a program. So in a new build, so someone else wrote a program that uses this function, if it doesn't say anything, uh, the program is going to use the second version because it's marked with two ads and it's the default symbol. Then that's how you write it. So see, uh, this is the user code. It just tells libamazing constant. And it, when it's going to be compiled and linked against libamazing, then the linker knows that he's trying to use the default version because it's marked as default. And so if I open the, the program, if I uh, OBJ dump the, the, the program, we're going to see that there is a call to that function over there, which is the newer version of the function. OK, so let's do some more API and ABI breaks, just for the sake of it. Uh, in, in version 1.1, I changed the return type again, because I'm crazy. Uh, and so now it's a double <laughs> now it's a it returns a returns a double type, so I have to write a new uh, internal implementation, and I have to change the versions file so that it has a new entry for the 1.1 uh, version of the library. Let's do it again, but now uh, let's not change the the API. We're just going to change the uh, internal behavior of the function. So previously, it used to return an amazing constant. I don't know what constant is so amazing, but yeah, it was an amazing constant. Now it just returns the number 12, which is amazing as well, but no, not, not that amazing. But you see, user programs were expecting something, and now they're going to get something different. This is an ABI break without an API break. So again, you just write a new internal implementation you declare it in the versions file, and you tie these names with the assembler directive Sinver. So if if we look at the new at, at this library that has a lot of internal functions using read elf, we're going to see that we have four versions of libamazing constant. Uh, all of them have their version string appended to the end at the end, and one of them is the default. It's the the most recent I marked as default. So new builds are going to use the default symbol, as I have mentioned previously. But what if we want to use the older version? Let's say I thought that the older behavior of the function was more uh, interesting. I said that amazing constant was way better than 12. So we can use header redirections. And this is also. Uh, not so hard to understand, but it's a bit different from the other examples. So header redirections are a compile time feature which produce some header magic that magically redirects functions call function calls. So it allows us to use an older ABI. So, and let's go back to our example. So in this, uh, I don't know which version is this. I have released too many versions in a single week. Uh, and in this new version, <laughs> uh, I have added a header magic to the, no, I have added magic to the header. And in this magic, I defined, uh, well, I protected a block of code with that if dev libamazing compat double. And so users that want to use the older behavior, which I'm calling the compat behavior, they can uh, define this constant. Maybe in compile time, they can define it with GCC. And when they compile their code, this block is going to be uh, present after the preprocessor runs. And that block of code is, is weird. Huh? It's uh, declaring a prototype for libamazing constant, and it has a NAS an ASM directive there, which just has the name of that internal implementation, double libamazing constant. I don't know how that works, but I don't. I know the output. So if we look at the output of that compilation, uh, 
we can't see anything weird in the .i file, which is the output of the preprocessor. But if we open the .s file, we can see that the, ch the call to uh, libamazin constant has been changed in the assembler language to call double libamazin. So we are bypassing uh, that version in. Uh, do you have a question? So you, you showed that uh, when you had the internal uh, declarations of the function, they are not listed as an object in the off file, right? In the read off. They I accidentally removed them. Uh, accidentally. Okay. But that there. was my question because then the compiler needs to find it, right? Yeah, they are there. They're, these functions, there. Uh, if you if you download, you can call them. Yeah. If you git clone the the example that I uh, posted in this in the slides, then you'll see the, the the functions there. There are some other tricks that you have to do. These functions have to be visible externally, so that you can do these header redirections. So okay, I was trying to uh, not talk about this because of the time, but okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's what I have to tell you about that fictional example which kind of makes my job easier to explain the real world example uh, in glibc. So in version 2.0, I guess it's 2.3 actually, but yeah, bear with me. Uh, the long double format in the PowerPC architecture, it had the same format of the double type. So it used to be a 64 bit floating point type. But then in version 2.4 of glibc, the internal representation of the long double type was changed and it became a 128-bit floating point type which has uh, an internal format uh, which th the format is called IBM Extended Precision. And we are currently working uh, on a new change to the format of the long double type. We are under development in so the next release of glibc is going to be 2.29 and we want to make the long double format equal a more common standard the IEEE quadruple precision format yeah it's hard to say that in English and in Portuguese okay so uh, let's use what we have learned before how to use the read elf command to list symbols and in the first block I open the libm.so.6 uh, shared object, which contains uh, all of the math functions that you all love. And there you can see that it marks with the blue color uh, sign L, and it's the sign L at glibc2.3. And if you check the address also in blue in this first column here, second column actually, it's the same address. So you can see that the sign l function is tied to the sign function, which, which makes sense because until glibc 2.3, long double and double had the same format. And once you change, then you have to use a new, in a new implementation and you have sign l ties to the sign l internal implementation. Same thing happens for all of the functions that somehow have to deal with long double uh, types. So it also means that the printf functions, the scanf functions, and many other functions, they have to have this, um, this mechanism and this uh, tie uh, between internal functions and external functions. Okay, but I also explained to you how to make uh, redirections using header magic, and glibc also provides that for you so if I said that somehow people might be, u might be interested in the older uh, version of an ABI, so if someone wants to use the 64 bits uh, wide uh, long double type, they can use that uh, GCC option over there. So dash M long double 64, and then long double have s will have 64 bits. And so glibc, what it does is it defines uh, one of those uh, redirection uh, statements that we have seen, but it defines this with a lot of macros. Barbosa is there? Barbosa? No. Okay. So, 
likes to mock me because I do a lot of macros. But yeah, so you make a lot of macros for each of the functions uh, that you need redirections for. Okay, and as I said before, we are working on the second transition of the long double format on glibc for PowerPC. And for this, we're going to reuse an API. We're going to reuse the Float 128 API, which have been very recently added to to glibc. To glibc. Well, we're not going to use the API per se. We're going to use the internal implementation and, and yeah, that's it. And as uh, Leonardo have already guessed, we're going to have uh, new exported symbols because because of the header redirections. Okay, so as a conclusion, uh, I would like to say that ABI changes happen. It's just a fact of life. Sometimes they are not backwards compatible and we have to deal with it. Uh, when it happens, uh, so name changes, they convey such information downstream, uh, so people don't suffer uh, with crashes and weird behaviors but this might require rebuilds and concurrent distributions of uh, versions of a library. Also, we have seen uh, symbol versioning, which kind of avoid the sole name changes, but it has an additional implementation cost. So you have to uh, maintain those versions files and those redirection redirections done with some header magic. So this has some extra cost, but I like that because I think of it as having as the upstream development having a downstream mindset. So you care about your downstream while you're working upstream. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, I have no idea what time it is, but I hope it's not too much.